Well, good evening. I was going to say y'all are going to get a rare treat, but it's just rare. <laughs> I'm going to leave the treat off, but uh, before I get going, it is Father's Day, and uh, I would just like to say thank you. I've been blessed with the best father that I could ever imagine. He's shown me the way. He's given advice, and very good advice. I didn't always heed it, but uh, when I didn't, yeah, I usually paid. But uh, any of us that were blessed with godly fathers that, that taught us the way and that kind of gave us an example of what maybe God was, we were truly blessed. And I'm going to tell you, I was blessed. Thank you, Pop. Um, you know, when you go to pick a lesson, and nobody told me what to preach, right? So the way I figured I was going to preach on the thing that I needed the most. So tonight my lesson is on obedience. And uh, that's something that, of course, I've struggled with. And I, I would dare say that I'm not alone. There's a lot of people. Obedience is defined by Merriam-Webster as a noun. And it means compliance with an order, request, or law, or submission to another one's authority. And uh, that last little part is probably what we have the most struggle with, is that submission. Submission to a greater authority than ourselves. Most of us don't want to admit that we're not the captain of this ship that we're on. And... Uh, that's, that's something that, of course, I've struggled with. As a young man, I wanted my way. Um, did a lot of things Dad still doesn't know about. And, uh, and we're trying to keep it that way. <laughs> but uh, it's, uh, the Lord has blessed me to survive all of it. And some of it has made me a better person. So uh, that's... I guess that's the way it goes with trials. If we survive them, we come out better. If we'll submit ourselves. All right. One thing that I've always emphasized, and where's Alexander? I don't see him there. He's up there. I'm Alexander and Rylan. I've, I've, pre I've pressed this lesson on them many times. We've talked so many of the, of the things that we study in our Bible classes and when, when we teach the younger kids that, there's so many lessons that are about obedience and follow, following God and following what uh, he wants us to do. And also, you know, submitting ourselves to our parents. That's where we first learned obedience. And that's where I, at a very young age, uh, got an encounter with my first authoritarian figure, Mom. <laughs> Mom was... Uh, she was very kind, very nice, very sweet most of the time, but unless you challenge her. I mean, I've got a great mom, and when I challenge her, and even notice my sisters and brothers when they challenged her, she knew how to take care of it. I'll just say this. Proverbs 13, 24 was something we didn't talk a lot about, but we definitely knew about it. Not spare the rod and spoil the child. Well, I won't say she's ever took a rod to me, but there's other things that work quite just as well. A belt or a fly flapper. Or I can still remember the time she, <laughs> my, my little brother and I, we fussed a lot. And we would often take it, almost every summer we went to see my grandparents in, in Kansas. And usually we'd stop somewhere between Nashville and Paducah, one of the two. And I can still remember my mom was telling us about that you boys are making me steal a fly flapper so I can beat you. And you, you're going to be part, part of the reason that I go to that bad place for stealing. <laughs> oh, that was so funny. But uh, looking back, it's funny, I'll tell you, but that fly flapper, when it turned around there and you were in the back seat and she was getting after you, it wasn't very nice. But we were learning. Um, 
Most all of us see in the current events, obedience is a problem. We've had the COVID-19 pandemic. And I can remember when they first started shutting everything down. Most of us were pretty compliant. But I remember it was spring break down in Miami. And uh, those kids were down there to party. And they were still on the beach. And they ended up having to send the police down there to break it up and shut the, shut the beach down. So, you know, kind of expect that out of young people maybe. But uh, that's, that's what happened there. Um, Along with that, these social distancing guidelines. I don't think any of us are doing that well with that. Uh, I know I'm not, and it's uh, at our at work. We we're requiring it when they're when they're with within six feet of each other. And buddy, I, I mean, I, I seem like I walk around all day. You know, hey guys, separate and social distance. Otherwise, they gotta wear a mask, so. Toughest thing to do. And then, recently, with all the protests, and I'm not gonna get into right and wrong, but with a whole lot of stuff, but I don't see a problem with protesting, but I can tell you at a very young age, my dear mother, made sure I understood that I couldn't hurt somebody else's property. That just wasn't allowed. So this, this burning and looting that's going on, uh, they didn't have Betty Gilmer for a mama, I can promise you. <laughs> and I also remember she taught me not to steal. I can tell you my, my thieving career started kind of young but it ended very young. <laughs> and I don't remember how old I was, Mama. I'm thinking about three or four years old. I was how old? Four? Three? But this is something that's burned into my memory banks, and God bless her, she taught me a great lesson. We were, and like I say, I pulled off my first heist. I was a small child, and we were in Cheek and Scott Drug Store over in Live Oak, Florida. And I, and I spotted a little flashlight, the little mini flashlights, and I wanted it. And I didn't get everything I wanted, believe it or not. I was a spoiled child, but I didn't get everything. And Mom said, no, you're not getting that. So I nonchalantly, when she turned her back, I just kind of slipped that thing into my pocket. And we walked on out of there. I must have been a pretty good thief, because nobody saw me. <laughs> Except I got about halfway home and I got that flashlight out and I was <laughs> playing with it. And my poor dear mother, she turned and she said, boy, what are you doing? And did you steal that flashlight? And I'm like, I really didn't even know what stealing was. I just wanted it. And that, you know, mom took the time to teach me a lesson that day and I've never forgot it. We turned the car around. We lived like nine miles out of Live Oak. And we were about halfway home, so she turned back around. We went back up to Cheek and Scott Drug, and she marched me in there, and I had to turn that flashlight back in and apologize to that manager of that store, and she explained to me what stealing was. I can tell you, that burned in my memory. And then later that evening, I had an uncle that was a highway patrolman. And he just happened to be coming through that evening. He lived in Pensacola at the time, I think. But he just happened to be coming through that evening. And uh, he looked at me and he said, boy, you were stealing, huh? Well, let me show you what we do with people that steal. And he handcuffed me to the leg on the TV. <laughs> It probably didn't last two minutes, but you know, to a little kid, it seemed like an eternity. And I knew, knew right then that uh, handcuffs were not going to be in my future if I could help it. That feeling of being no freedom stuck in my little mind as a small child, and it's never left me. So to this day, I don't take anything 
at least not on purpose. I sometimes have to take pens back to work. But uh, thanks, Mom. You taught me a great lesson. Um, anyway, I contend that obedience has always been a struggle for mankind. Like I say, I know I've had my troubles with it. Disobedience seemed to come natural to us. And, and just last Sunday, you're talking about disobedience and maybe mischievousness. We were, oh, uh, Ryan mentioned about the child pulling somebody's wig off. Well, my son was one of them. And my, young, my oldest son, Jared, he must have been two years old probably. And we were sitting behind a lady, and we, I didn't even know she had a wig, but she pulled, he pulled her wig off right there in the middle of church service. And so uh, anyway, we got to cutting up about it after service last Sunday morning, and Trevor and I, we were talking, and Trevor says, you must have taught him to do that. You remember what I said, Trevor? I said, I never had to teach my boys to be bad. <laughs> That's something they get on their own. Or maybe from their dad, I don't know. But uh, it, it ne never was a challenge to uh, have them do something bad. That never was anything I worked at. But they, they love to cut up and do stuff. But uh, that's the way young children are. We have to teach them obedience. Anyway, the Bible is full of examples of disobedience. And I find it fascinating that no Bible character, of, and y'all can challenge me on this, but I'll say it, no Bible character of any of substance or something that we need to know about, besides Jesus, made it out of this world without make, having a sin or doing, being disobedient at some point. Uh, Adam, he got us all started off right out of the gate. Decided he needed to eat of that tree of knowledge of good and evil. Abraham, the father of the nations, the father of our faith, he struggled a few times. We're mentioning there, he, he and Sarah uh, were impatient about having that child for the, you know, that was going to be the promised child. And they just made a pact, and he had a child with Hagar. And then there was a time he lied to the Egyptians about uh, that Sarah wasn't his wife. That was his sister. So, And then Moses, the lawgiver, he struggled. I mean, there's a number of times that he was disobedient to the Lord. But the, the one thing that I always remember in Numbers 20 God told him to speak to the rock and they would all get water because they, they were without a water and they were all upset with him and they, they wondered why he brought them out there in the desert to kill them. So anyway, God said, well, Moses, speak to the rock. Well, he got angry and hit the rock with his staff. And for that very reason right there, he was told he would never go into the promised land. So disobedience is not anything new to man. We pretty much, I think we're kind of built that way. Tonight's lesson text, though, is on 1 Samuel 15. And Samuel comes to anoint Saul as the king of Israel and deliver a message to, from God to Samuel. He, uh, in 1 Samuel 15, verse 2, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel. And he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go to attack Amalek and utterly destroy all they have and do not spare them. But kill both man and woman, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep and camel and donkey. Now a lot of people have a lot of trouble with this passage sometimes. It's is genocide. And, but 
I'm of the opinion that we need to trust God and that they needed to be punished. God was going to punish them whether Samuel did it or he did it on his own. That's what was going to happen. And the way I look at it, Saul was going to be his instrument here. And like I say, God could have easily done it himself, but he, was, he had a test here for Saul. Well, Saul went out and he partially obeyed. He went out and destroyed the, the Amalekites. But he didn't kill everything and everybody. They brought back the best of the best and they brought back King Agag. 1 Samuel 15.10 Now the word of God came to Samuel saying, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as a king, for he has turned his back from following me and has performed not my commandments. And then the next morning, the Lord came to Samuel again. He says, Saul went to Carmel and indeed set up a monument for himself. And he has gone around, passed by, and gone down to Gilgal. So Saul had gone out and set up his own little altar to have people worship him, I think, is where I read this. But Samuel went to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And then Samuel, and this is the one I always remember Samuel said unto Saul in 1 Samuel 15, 14. What then is this bleeding of sheep in my ears and the lowing of oxen which I hear? Samuel knew that Saul had, not, had disobeyed God. And then Saul proceeded to blame everyone but himself. The people made me bring all these sheep and oxen back. And people made me do it. And then he also spared King Agag. Samuel then gives us these words that we need to take into account every day. And they're to help us. And the words that I try to remember. 1 Samuel 15, 22. Has the Lord as a great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices? As in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is an iniquity and idolatry. Following Samuel's lead, I'd like to think that the, some of the root causes to lack of obedience are as follows. Number one, there, there's, there's the temptation. Two, rebellion and stubbornness. And then three, spiritual immaturity. As for temptation, we see things that, that are, our eyes see things that think we're going to get pleasure from it. And it's what we desire. Saul desired adoration of people. He allowed them to bring back the spoil from the battlefield. God did not allow this in this circumstance. I mean, it was pretty common for them to bring back stuff and then sacrifice. But God was very explicit about what he wanted. He wanted these people completely wiped out. He didn't say bring back anything for a sacrifice. We have a lot of temptations in this life. There's material things admirations from others, riches of the world, and honor. Honors to us. And like I say, that Saul was seeking the honor of men and not God. Rebellion and stubbornness is another thing we need to talk about. It's a direct result of the lack of faith that God is the supreme being and must be honored. We trust ourselves and set up 
ourselves as a God instead of the biblical teachings and principles. If we are honest with ourselves, I am certain we can think of many times that we chose our own path against the will of the Lord. And then there's what I call spiritual immaturity. If we don't know the scriptures and learn to apply them, we're going to suffer. Our faith must be built block by block on God's word. We can get better at fighting off temptations and our own selfish desires by delving into the word of God. Study and prayer will help us build our spiritual maturity and we must engage other Christians to help us do this. Obedience is a fundamental element of the Christian life. Many joys will follow if we will submit ourselves to God and his word. Saul had the temptation of offering a great sacrifice for God. We don't have that temptation anymore. There's been a sacrifice. Jesus is our sacrifice. We don't have to sacrifice animals anymore for our sins and roll them forward like the people in the Old Testament. The ultimate sacrifice has been done. We can't impress God with our sacrifice. There's nothing that compares to Christ giving up himself as a son of God on the cross for our sake, for us and our, our souls. There's nothing else to be done in sacrifice. God wants our obedience. We need to submit to him. If you haven't submitted to God, you can begin tonight. Begin now by submitting yourself to his son, Jesus Christ, and obeying the gospel call. Hear the good news of Christ. Believe that he died for our sins. Repent of your sins. Confess his name as your savior. And then be baptized for the remission of sins. With this beginning, and you can continue in your faith, you can build those building blocks that will continue to work toward your salvation. If you wish to submit to Christ and his will tonight, or if you have another need, that you come forward as we sing this imitation song.